everybody, I'm Timothée Ravier and I work at Red Hat in the Chorus team. And uh, I'm Jean-Baptiste Ristram and I work in the Chorus team at, uh, as well at Red Hat. So welcome to our talk, uh, which is Road to Trusted and Measured Bootchain in Bootable Container. So first up, uh, what's a Bootable Container? Who here in this audience already built a container? You know, creating a container file, uh, add a couple of uh, run comments, copy your config in there, and then push that to a registry. So uh, what's cool is that you can ship your whole Linux distro in that, push that to a container, and uh, deploy it on your machine. And uh, you probably already, already know how to do that. So uh, what are bootable containers? That's uh, an evolution of RPM OS3 systems that have been around for a while. Uh, under the hood, uh, that's under the hood for Fedora Silverblue, Kinoite, some others that you may ha have heard of. We'll go into RPM OS3 later uh, in detail, but uh, in short, the operating system is composed as an image, including the necessary booting bits, kernel, in RAMFS, and so on. And that's the whole thing is packaged into a container. Uh, Colin and Ben will give a ton, ton of details in the Dome at 3.20 today. So the call, the, their talk is called Bootsy, Generating an Ecosystem Around Bootable Containers. Uh, are those real containers? Yeah, uh, they are OCI images, Open Container Initiative. And all the tools that you know work, you can run them, sign them. Uh, de derive and push them to registry, all the bell bells and whistles that uh, you are used to. Then you can get a bootable ISO or a VM disk image uh, use, using, for example, the Bootsy Image Builder project. Uh, another approach is to get a live environment and then rebase from that. Again, go to Colleen and Ben talk this afternoon for more details. So what happened on my, on my machine? Uh, Bootsy and RPM OS3 are doing the magic, taking the uh, container and then giving you a booting machine on, on your local system. OS3 will unpack the containers and in the OS3 object store, sets up the kernel and initramfs from known location and then uh, generate some bootloader config. I just said that OS3 unpack the file on disk. Let's go into more details into how that works. So. A bit like Git, uh, OS3 stores files and metadata in an object repository. Note that multiple commits can be checked out at the same time. Uh, and the object store is just, is just files, just like Git, so they can be easily deduplicated. Then uh, all of those features gives you atomic, safe, and efficient updates. Uh, OS3 will just atomically swap a symlink when you do an update, giving you uh, really the safety of pulling the plug anytime you want and you don't get a broken system. And then, as I said, you can check out multiple commits and that gives you as many rollback options as you want. Let's uh, illustrate how that work. So in the center you have uh, that OS3 repository, the object store. Uh, everything starts with a commit pointing to a root directory object. Uh, that directory object here in yellow contains a list of files and other directories, eventually pointing to the files object. The directory object is a bit like a hash map for each entry you have. The name it's going to have in the deployed file system and its hash, which is used to find it into the object store. So let's uh, go through the step of deploying, actually deploying a commit. The folder hierarchy is going to be created following the directory object's path um, from, top to, from top to bottom. You can see here all the color, ma the color matching showing how each directory object is translated into a directory into the, the deployment folder. And then the file content are just hard links pointing back to the OS3 object stores. Then an update came in and then you have a second commit into the OS3 repository. Uh, you can see that the blue file here is fail, uh, shared between the two commits, so that's less download and less disk usage. And then when checking out that second commit, once again, we create the folder, uh, di the directory hierarchy using directory objects. And then we link back to the object store, uh, the files. 
Here you can see that the user being true binary was not updated between the two updates, and so we can share uh, the same file object in the OS, the sorry, the object storage, and hence reduce the disk usage. Let's quickly go over how OS3 compares to other well-known file system images approach. Um, usually, the image-based system rely on whole disk images. Um, Android is a famous example for that. You ship the whole image and do A, B deployment. So if you're booted on A, uh, download the image, write on B, then reboot on that. But that uh, requires double the space or triple if you want two rollbacks. <laughs> And uh, this could be worked around with more complexity like LVM or relying on specific file system, but that's extra complexity, right? On the other hand, OS3 just work without any disk images uh, because it's ag agnostic on, uh, of the file system, right? Just using hard links. So we're free of uh, disk disks fixed, fixed size disk images, sorry. And then uh, we can easily share the, the whole passion with the used data. So less setup complexity overall. Uh, I think that title was about booting, so let's see how that boot. So currently for OS3 distribution, the, the secure boot scenario look like that. Uh, the usual firmware load shim, which chain load grub to, which chain load kernel. Uh, grub read the configuration uh, from the config file and uh, give the pass to the initialFS to the kernel, which unpack that in memory. Um, here you can see that once we are, the, we, once we are in the initialFS, OS3 gets the commit hash to deploy from the command line arguments and then find the deployed path that I showed you earlier uh, in the rootFS and then pivot into that. Note here that the white boxes in, in that schema are not covered by any integrity or security. So here with secure boot on OS3 based system, we only have secure boot from the grub2 and kernel and the other bits are not encrypted, not signed. So yeah, that's the main weakness of the current setup. Also, once booted, we have no runtime integrity. So if the file system changes under you, you cannot uh, notice that change. Uh, the, OS, the object in the OS3 object store might be tampered with, and you cannot see that unless you reboot and do a whole file system uh, integrity check, which is kind of slow. But uh, Timote has a nice solution to that. Thanks, Lamatisse. All right, so now we're going to look at how we're going to introduce integrity in all of those pieces. And one of those is going to be ComposerFS. So ComposerFS itself, despite the name, is not an actual file system. It's a combination of different things, different features of the Linux kernel. And it's actually using a, an actual file system underneath, which is HeroFS. So it's a set of user space tool that combines OverlayFS, HeroFS, and FS variety, so three features of the Linux kernel. So the first one of those is HeroFS. So HeroFS is a read-only file system, which is relatively recent uh, compared to other file systems. Uh, the idea with ComposeFS is that we only store the hierarchy of the file system inside the HeroFS. So we don't actually store the file data, we just store the hierarchy and all the metadata, so all the file permissions, the extended attributes, and all those things. So no file data. And, but we still need to get to this file data at some point, and so ComposeFS does that by writing special attributes inside, special extended attributes inside the HeroFS, which are called these trusted overlay redirect one, which points to the actual data. And this data is actually stored in another layer, and this is the job of overlayFS. Here we use overlayFS, ComposeFS uses overlayFS to compose, to, to stick together the HeroFS, which has the ER key, and the actual data, which is stored in the OS3 repository. So OverlayFS itself uses, we use only the data only layer feature, and it provides a view of the OS3 repository that is just of the objects, the actual file content of the repository, and everything is still stored on the underlying file system, uh, on normal partition, and this grants us a few nice features. So we get on disk and in-memory cache duplication. Uh, and 
kind of like an object-like uh, addressing of the content that we have in the, on, the, on the disks. And finally, to get the full integrity story, we can combine this with FS Verity. So the idea behind FS Verity is that you can hash the kernel to make files read-only and compute a hash uh, of the content of the, of the file. And FS, we can, with ComposeFS, we can include this hash, uh, this FS Verity hash of the files inside the EROFS blob directly uh, in the extended attributes. This guarantees us that we get the full integrity for the file data uh, on the disk just by looking at a, sing a single EROFS uh, blob uh, RailFS uh, file system from ComposeFS. These AeroFS file system itself can be FS Verity verified, FS Verity uh, hashed, uh, so that you get the full, the full story. So let's look at how this works with OS3 when everything is integrated together. The idea is so, as we've seen previously, we have an OS3 repository, it has a few uh, commits, metadata, and, um, and files. Um, with OS3, we're going to generate, with ComposeFS and OS3 integrated together, we're going to generate uh, from this metadata an EROFS file. Uh, we generate it like, in a repository fashion. It's, all, it's, it's deterministic, so we always get the same one. And, and so the entire file ER key is going to be stored in this file here. And on the side, we generate the, the slash C content. So that's when we create a deployment. And then we're going to make that visible for the system uh, in, in the slash the root, the root moon point. And the, so the first bit of it is that we're going to create an overlay moon point. And one part of this overlay moon point is going to be the RFS, which has the hierarchy of the files. So it's the one we just created. Then as part of this overlay FS moon point, the second layer is going to be the data only layer, which is essentially a view of the objects that are stored in the repository. So here we have one file, and so as part of the R key, it's stored under a hashed name, uh, and it points to the actual content, which is stored on the root partition. And finally, to tie all, all of that together, um, we have the trusted overlay redirect extended attributes in the ERFS, which points to the actual content in the data-only overlay FS layer, which in turn points to the actual content on the disk. And to get integrity, we do the same thing with FS Verity. The data just is in the ERFS metadata, points to uh, and gets back to the, the, the actual file, which is FS Verity um, locked into the OS3 repository. All right. And with no, uh, we will that up. Let's look at how we can add a UKI to the mix now. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, the, in our current secure boot story, the Initrom FS and uh, common line, uh, kernel common line setup is uh, not uh, protected in any way. So uh, there is an easy solution for that. That's UKI. We're not the first to talk about that this morning, obviously. So, long story short, it's just packing uh, the kernel DNA-TRAMFS, the common line option, into, say, into one EFI binary that we secure boot sign. Um, the <coughs> trick that we do here is that we link uh, the ComposeFS that we deploy on in the DNA-TRAMFS from the, from the UKI DNA-TRAMFS. So, basically, we, we add a public key into that DNA-TRAMFS at build time, and then uh, when OS3 will uh, mount the ComposeFS, it can verify the, the OS3 signature uh, to which the ComposeFS digest is attached to. So let's tie all that together and look how the, how the full boot chain looks like. So firmware loads systemd boot. Uh, systemd boot then loads the UKI, which is secure boot sign. And then uh, from, that, from the initial FS there, we can trust that we are actually loading the right OS3 commit because we can verify the signature with the key that we have in the initial FS. Uh, the keen eyes may notice that the root FS box is still white um, because it's not encrypted nor signed. However, the content can still be trusted because uh, if they were altered offline, then the FS variety digest wouldn't match what the Compose FS expects, and then you would be prevented to read by bad data. Uh, we'll demo that in a minute. 
So how do we build the, those images? Let's look at all the things that we need to do in the right order to achieve that. First up, we start with a simple key pair. Um, and then loading usual configuration file and RPM package, we compose, uh, using OS3, we compose uh, our, our, our root FS, making sure that we include the public key that we generated before in the initrom FS. That gives us a uh, NoS3 commit. Uh, we make sure to sign that OS3 commit uh, with the private key we had before, and then throwing away the key. Uh, that's important. Then from that OS3 commit, we extract what we need to build a new key, so kernel command line, uh, the OS3 commit hash that we just signed, uh, in neutron FS kernel. Pack them all together in the U into a UKI uh, that we secure boot key, uh, we secure boot sign with our uh, our secure boot private key. Uh, in the purpose of our demo, we also extract systemd boot from there because right now in, in Ferro it's not signed uh, for shim. And then finally, we pack all that together into container images and push that to a container registry. Um, in the demo, um, we have a VM that de demonstrates all of that, and everything is built uh, from a GitHub action. So that's a, that's a standard core S uh, VM that we transition to our ComposeFS uh, signed uh, deployment. So here you can see that uh, secure boot is well enabled, that we've, we've booted the UKI that is fully measured. Yeah, so it's on the bottom of the screen. I know it's a bit hard to see, but basically that's the path to the ESP uh, showing the UKI that we've, we've just booted. Here, yeah, that's our command line option. Uh, basically, the, what I want to show here is that the command line options contain the OS3 hash that uh, we want to boot from the initromfs. So yeah, secure boot is enabled, and uh, we are, we've enrolled our custom, our custom secure boot key in the UE5 firmware. Again, that's the usual path to our UKIs. And then uh, we have the root uh, ComposeFS file system. Um, we can sh we can see how ComposeFS uh, reference files from the OS3 object repo. Also note that the mount is read-only by default. So now here's the interesting part of the demo. Um, what I want to do is uh, temper a file in the OS3 uh, object storage and then make sure that I'm not able to read it afterwards. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to temper the OS release file. For that, I needed previously to remount the OS3 object storage uh, read-write, because by default, it's mount read-only. So I have a small script that helps me to, um, to find the OS3 back backing file, uh, because, it's, as I said, it's, it's referenced by its, its content hash. So not, now that I have the path to that file, I'm just making a small backup to restore the, the system in, in its original state afterward. Then uh, I'm going to delete the file and then rewrite the content. And now if I try to read that file again, I'm going to have to drop the kernel caches because as I just read the file, it's going to be in cache. So dropping the cache there and then trying to read again the file. And then I'm, I'm greeted with a nice uh, IO error. Uh, because uh, 
uh, compose FS uh, complain that he's not finding the FS VT digest because the file I just created doesn't have any digest. Uh, let's ap uh, apply a digest to, the, to that file. OS3 does that for us easily. And then reading again, still an error. And now we can see that the digest, digest doesn't match what was expected in the, in the Compose FS. And then that's basically the demo. All right. Um, so with the integration of ComposeFS into the boot chain, we get to a state where we have a fully trusted boot chain. UKI signed by Sikiboot keys, ComposeFS uh, verifying the integrity of the files on the disk uh, for us for the rootFS. So we have, we have this full boot chain. And then we can start looking uh, as uh, measured. I know that's like two, two, two things are kind of disconnected, but the idea is that once you have the trusted full boot chain, it's a little bit easier to set up measured boot uh, and set up, for example, uh, TPM bound disk encryption on your RoadFS or uh, your disks uh, for your data. So we can do that with systemd encryption rule, for example. And yeah, having signed Secuboot UKIs make all of this much more easier to do um, because you can directly bind into a uh, set of uh, the Persia 7, for example, if you just have your keys enrolled into the firmwares. And so you can trust uh, that you're only booting the things that you have signed. So we only really at the beginning of our journey on, on the side of uh, the measured boot part. So you've seen a lot of, a lot of talks in this session have been around much more complex setups. Uh, here we, we are really at the beginning here. So with that, we have a few remaining challenges uh, that we're going to look at uh, with, the, with all of the setups. Um, so one other thing that you might have seen here is that there's still a lot of white boxes here. So a lot of, on the right, the root FS itself, the content of the deployment is protected, but everything else is not. That's a strong difference between uh, what we have, uh, what, we, what we have in, in other classic uh, DMVD setups and all those things. So, so we'll, look at, we'll look at that. Um, another thing here is that there's this weird relationship between having a public key into the TramFS and having the, the ComposeFS itself, uh, EuroFS being on the file system, uh, deploying being deployed there, and the relationship with OS3 commits. It's all linked to history of how this was, was done before and how this is done right now. Uh, but the idea is that we want to remove all of this complexity and simplify the things a little bit. So one of this is uh, we want to remove the dependency of actual using OS3 deployment hash, um, any, not using OS3 deployment hash anymore to, in, in this boot chain. Um, to remove one of those last spots from the, from the kernel command line that is uh, actually different from each deployment. Uh, to do that, uh, the, the, the goal is to include directly the EROFS part of ComposeFS in the, in, in the UKI, in the initRFS. So you would have the ComposeFS, the root FS, the hero FS of ComposeFS be the actual root of truth of like what you're going to boot on your system, what's going to look like, what your system is going to be look like, because the hero FS has the whole hierarchy of the files and the metadata. So a boot, a boot, would, a boot with this change would look something like that. Uh, we would still have a trusted boot chain, so we would have shim in the middle, uh, we would have back shim in the middle, systemd boot, choose a UKI, and then you would have the actual EROFS blob directly into the initRAMFS, and it would know exactly what it wants to boot, and you would find the rest of the content on the root FS. And you would only essentially look at the actual file data on the root FS. You wouldn't look anymore at anything else, uh, any, any other things. Um, so that would really make the actual root FS, uh, the actual obstry, uh, object, repository, object repository on the disk be something like S3, really, really an object storage, because the metadata would be fully into, uh, sold into the EROFS in the UKI. With this setup, uh, we still have a few white boxes, uh, notably, uh, so the root FS itself is not protected, uh, and everything that you had uh, on top, um, we're aware of that. Uh, the Main difference uh, between the setups, between the OS3 setups and the disk image-based setups, uh, is that 
we don't use DM, DM Verity, for example, uh, so you don't have the full protection around all the content that is stored in the partition. So you still have to use something else to do that. Uh, so for example, encryption or, but actual encryption we know is not integrity, so it's two different things, but it still makes things harder, and uh, for most setup, it's going to be the default thing. You're going to have to encrypt the whole root uh, partition, uh, especially everything, financial computing and all those things. Uh, so that's likely going to be the case anyway, so encryption is going to be like likely to be the, the, the basics. Uh, and then if you actually want full integrity on all the file system metadata bits that are not covered by ComposeFS, uh, you would have to go beyond and do DM integrity directly completely on, on, the, on the root of this partition. Um, so yeah, that's for more, I would say, paranoid use cases. Um, one uh, other bit uh, is that you have the content of, of slash itsy uh, that is stored as well uh, in, in, the, in the deployments. Uh, so when you create a new version, when you install a new, when you set up a new version of the system, uh, OS3 will create also as well the content of, OS3, of slash itsy into the deployment, and you need to protect that as well. Once you have ComposeFS, you can do different options. Uh, you can use only, for example, the slash itsy that is included as part of the image, and just keep it as read-only and don't do anything, anything on top. Or you can even m mount a transient, uh, version, a transient overlay, temporary FS uh, overlay on top of slash sheet C and so do any changes there that you need live, uh, maybe copy configs, assign configs from somewhere else uh, or for a deployment mechanism or something else. Uh, but, but throw it all away when you reboot your system and go back to a fresh pristine uh, slash sheet C uh, content. So that's the thing that are already com uh, supported with ComposeFS um, that are much more easier to do with this, with this kind of setups. The next thing, the next challenge with all of this is uh, the work, working around what the discoverable partition specification gives us uh, for, for um, disk partition setups. Um, so with a UKI, it means that essentially you get kind of a fixed kernel command line. You cannot change the kernel command line as easily as you would in a classic setup where you can just change anything because nothing is really measured or verified uh, here. The main trick is that for bootable container systems, the kernel command line is actually included into the container. So you have the kernel, the init RD, and everything, and all the content that you want to do or that you want to put into your kernel command line. So before we generate the UKI, you can change your container, change the content there, make sure you have the actual bits that you want to have in your kernel, final kernel command line, and then generate the UKI with those bits, and, and, then, and then use this UKI for, on your setup. But, so we have this flexibility of like creating multiple UKIs for that could address different setups, but still, we don't necessarily want to create one UKI per system that we are going to install. So we still need to be this as like generic as possible uh, on the system. And so one way to do this uh, is to use the discoverable, discoverable partition specification. So you can set specific IDs on the partitions so that the uh, generator, the system, the GPT generator in the interface will figure out, okay, this one I have to mount at this point and uh, try and uh, open the Lux devices inside of it and do all of these setups without you actually having to specify which partition goes where directly. So yeah, that's the idea. But to do that, uh, essentially, we have to integrate that into the whole ecosystem. Uh, right now, bits and pieces in Fedora don't really do that well. Uh, so it means changing things in Iconda, changing things in the installers. Uh, changing things in Bootsy and to understand that, hey, okay, now we're going to install this root partition, it has to have this specific ID. The next thing we want to, uh, to look at is bridging the gap between actual container images format that we have right now in ComposeFS and notably AeroFS. So the idea is that when you get a standard OCI container images, uh, you get a tar and JSON metadata. So it's the content is all there, but for us, uh, if you want to create right now a bootable container, it's still a special process, and those images are not like, they are standard OCI images, but they still need a special process to be created so that they, they, they fit into the best thing, because there's bits and pieces that are not 
stored well into the actual uh, container format, notably extended attributes and all those things. So that's where um, this gets interesting, is that um, we want to look into making ComposerFest be the default way to store container images on the system. And so whether it's actual bootable containers or normal container images, we would have everything using ComposerFest. So using dduplicate storage uh, for files, dduplicate um, cache, uh, dduplicate memory usage as well. So if you have uh, 10 times uh, a base image, a federal base image, you don't have 10 times the memory usage. Even if there's just like difference uh, in them, you would still get shared, uh, shared uh, memory usage and shared content on the disk with ComposeFS. And so that's like the, the big thing here, figuring out a way to put down, to take back, take those images and, and convert them in some form or use a slightly different format that would be good with ComposeFS uh, by default. So yeah, it's all going to, the idea is really making ComposeFS, ERFS, the source of truth of all of those metadata, all of those actual file hierarchies on the system. Uh, yeah, the main missing bit is Sarinux because uh, if you know, uh, Sonix works with containers, essentially it does not. We hide a Sonix from containers, and so now we need to make containers aware of Sonix again. Another big important bit is moving away for, from grep2. Uh, so uh, as there's been a lot of talks as well in, in this session around this. Um, we could technically make this work with grep2, but it would be a little more painful. Uh, one thing that is much more elegant in system debug is that it does not have a configuration file, and it does not measure its configuration into the PCRs, because there's nothing impacting the actual thing that you're booting. With system debug, you just choose the UK you want to you wanna boot. And so that makes things much easier uh, with using system debug. And so we would have to teach that as well, and figure out the integration bits into the, all the Ferrari ecosystem uh, to make sure that we get actual system to install, um, correctly installed there. One uh, other last bit around this is uh, around the extension. So we've talked about how fixed the UKI command line is, but of course, there's always going to be the case where you want to change the UKI and you don't want to rebuild the whole thing, rebuild another image, uh, or redo the whole thing. And so that's where kernel command line extension come on with UKI add-ons. Um, for this, we need shim in the boot process. No, we don't, apparently. OK, so there's something wrong on my side, sorry. <laughs> Luca will, will, will explain us later. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we need to figure out something. We haven't been able to get this work right now. Uh, we need to figure out exactly what's missing for us to make this work. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's something pretty common, like you want to get debug a system in production, and you, at the same time, you don't want to break out the glass, resign stuff, and all the things, change completely things, so you need to be able to bring your own uh, kernel command line arguments, even if it's just temporary, on a system, uh, or fix this iSCSI or this disk that is behaving incorrectly on the system and, and, and set up something, and so that's really something we want to have. Uh, the other side thing here is that, for example, if you look at desktop systems, uh, even if you have all this set up nicely, you might sometimes still need to be able to type your um, your boot pass phrase, your boot um, your disk encryption pass phrase uh, live on the system, and you need it to be in the correct key map on, that is configured on your keyboard. So you still need to be able to add a UKI add-on to set the correct console key map uh, for your system, uh, so that it's still a nice experience, at least for the first boots before you set up things or in case of recovery. So that's like one of the last bits that we need to, to figure out. And with all of that, thank you very much for your attention. And we want to extend a special thanks to all of the projects that actually make this possible. Uh, now this presentation is essentially it's, uh, us uh, trying to align everything so that it fits well together, but we couldn't make all of this work without all the work that has happened beforehand, uh, especially in the Bootsy, OS3, SystemD project, ComposeFS, of course, and all the federal Linux community. So thank you very much. Questions? Yes.
I'm curious about uh, what's your story on uh, like golden images that you deploy on a on a system for the first time. You mentioned that you want to encrypt the disk, but um, that kind of implements that you also want to do re-encryption because, uh, as I understand, your security model relies on the disk encryption. So, uh, uh, what's your story there? Like, uh, let's say you have a pre-built image and you want to boot it for the first time in your little new VM. How does the disk encryption get set up? Like, uh, you follow my question? So, yeah, I think I'm interested. So, the question is about how do you do with golden image that you upload, for example, that you have a cloud provider and you have preset images on the system. How do you do set all of that up? So, there's multiple way to do that. One of the things that is used right now uh, in in core systems, for example, is ignition. And on first boot, you can tell ignition to re-encrypt the, the file system and reset up everything. So, you would still use ComposeFS to like actual we read the data on the disk image okay. and be sure that it's the But the keyword right you said one, was re-encryption, right? Like, so you're gonna, like, the keyword you said was re-encryption. So you're gonna ship an encrypted disk with some public key, and then on, on first boot, you're gonna re-encrypt every sector? Sorry, I said re-encryption, it's encryption. So you would start with a plain disk image, and you would then read the data. You can sh be sure that it's the actual one, because it's composed of this verified. And but then you how can it be? How can that be? Because it's on a file system. How did you establish the trust in the file system? So yeah, on first boot, on first boot, you wouldn't have the actual trust in the file system metadata in the not the file, the content, but the actual file system metadata. For sure, that's like a venue of attack. But yeah. But uh, okay, so so, so you drop the the unencrypted file system on the image. And how does the encryption then get added to this? So what happens on first boot is that you boot a system in init RAMFS. You would fetch a config that would say, OK, now I'm going to use uh, an encrypted disk. So I'm going to use confidential mode, essentially, confidential computer mode. And so it would use, still use a composed FS from the init RAMFS and look at the content on the disk, read all of that into memory, then set up, again, the disk using uh, Lux encryption, bind this to the TPM, do all the things, write back the data on the disk, and, but, and yeah, continue booting uh, on the okay, system. But that's, that's what I would, would call re-encryption, right? Like, so that's what you do. That was my question. Like, okay. So that you do re-encryption. Any other question? Yes. How exactly do you manage that the FS Verity hash of a file is checked against the extended attribute in the EROFS? How does that work? So that's that's done. That's not done by us. That's done by the kernel. Uh, so when you set up this overlay mount uh, and you tell, so there's two parts. Like you, when you write the file into onto the disk, you have the kernel compute the hash, mm -hmm. and then when you set up the overlay mounts, we can put a fs, and you have the hash, the visibility hash in the euro fs, and something in the kernel uh, on the overlay fs mount. To be honest, I don't know exactly. Check that the data is. The, the hash actually matches when you access the data. So it's implemented in OverlayFS or? Exactly which part of the kernel this okay. is implemented, I don't know, but it's, uh, yeah. OK, thanks. My colleague is saying it's in AeroFS. No, uh, overlay, sorry. So this is implemented in OverlayFS. In OverlayFS, you have the, they, they created this thing for the copy up, right? Like so that. Uh, uh, to, to make it efficient, they originally added the copy up logic, where basically you can have the data of a file on one layer, and then on the on the upper layer you have the a reference to that file with new extended attributes. And for this stuff, they added the ability that you can also encode FS Verity on that on these reference things, and these references are now public API and overlay FS, and they originally went. So what they are doing is basically creating an EROFS that doesn't contain any real stuff, but only contains these references, which are. Yeah, basically, the, all the information is in X address. But yeah, so this is enforcing kernel. Well, but you can change the year of and then, because it's not signed. But anyway, yes, question there. So I just wonder how would an OS upgrade look like? So you pull a new uh, OS tree, and you deploy a new UKI image? 
that's about it. So yeah, when you do a nice update, you pull out the new content into the repo. Um, you get the UKI, so either from the same container image or another one on the side. Set it up on the disk. Create a new deployment, so you create a new version of slash ct because you have slash ct, right now you have slash ct for each deployment you have on your system, each version, and then you reboot. Uh, so, sorry, I was shaking my head when you said you need shim. What I meant is that you, for your demo, you had your self enroll certificate in DB. In that case, you don't need shim. You need shim only if you're doing your filter party CA, and so you have your own, your keys in mock, only in that case. I say that because the guy at the back gets very angry when I say you need shim for this, <laughs> but you don't. Um, okay, so that is all the time we have. Thank you. <laughs>